Psalms chapter 10, uh, moving along here through the book, it starts out there in verse number 1 and says, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? And I don't know that this is necessarily how David feels, that he feels that God is afar off, that God is distant. And I think when we get towards the end here, we'll see what's really going on, why David is making a statement like this. But uh, when we do read that, we can get a sense that sometimes it does seem like that, doesn't it? Sometimes... When we're going through a difficult time, we're going through a hard time, it, it can seem like God is very far off. And we'll say things like, well, why, God, why is God allowing this to happen in my life? Why am I going through this hard time? Why is something bad happening to me? Where is the Lord? Why does he hide himself in times of trouble? I don't think that's how David feels, but you could understand why p somebody might actually feel that way. Uh, but we understand also that that's never the reality of the situation. You know, we might be tempted and in our flesh, we say things like that, you know, it just doesn't seem like God is near. But we know from Scripture that God is always near. And if you would, go over to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. We get there, put something in there, we're going to come back to Hebrews 13. You know, often in life, it might seem like God is very far, especially when we're going through a hard time. And, you know, I don't know that we've, any of us have gone through quite the hardest time as David has, although perhaps. Uh, David's, you know, of course, being pursued in the wilderness. He's been run out of his own land. Uh, and he's got a lot of enemies, a lot of a very difficult thing is going on in his life. Again, I don't know that's necessarily how he feels. We'll see towards the end why I believe he made that statement. But it can seem that way, doesn't it, sometimes in our life that God is very distant when we go through hard things. But we know that the reality is that God is always near. Here in Hebrews th uh, 13, it says in Joshua 1, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, so as I, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people thou shalt divide for inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. So, of course, Joshua being told before he goes in the promised land that he is to be strong, he is to be of good courage. And why? Because God is always going to be with him. He said, I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And look, we, as in, in our human relationships, we're going to let each other down. We're going to fail each other to some degree or another. People are going to forsake one another, but we can always trust in the fact that God is always going to be there for us, that he will always be faithful to us, that he will always be there to help us. And of course, this is the passage that is being quoted in Hebrews 13, where it says in verse 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So not only was that a promise that God made to Joshua, but Paul here in Hebrews is even that applying that unto us saying, look, we also are, have the promise that God is never going to leave us, that God is never going to forsake us. But what was the other part of that message that he gave to Joshua? Was that he, because of that, he was to be strong and of a good courage. You know, we should never allow ourselves to get taken down, you know, get in the dumps. You know, I understand we, we go through hard times, we have ups and downs, but we, you know, God, we should always understand that God is always there for us and will see us through those hard times. That's never, that's never a reason to quit. We should never quit on God, no matter how hard things get. God is always there for us. Amen. And again, we'll see at the end why, David, why I believe David made this statement. And maybe David is very well, he very well could be feeling this way. But before we get to that, I want to kind of look into uh, the wicked tonight. Because David starts to kind of describe these wicked people that he's dealing with. And it's just kind of a good idea, uh, or a good uh, opportunity rather, to see what the wicked are like, you know. Because you, you'll hear preachers and other, you know, get up and, and, and Christians say, hey, you know, the wicked people, how, how bad they are. And even to the point where, you know, men like David have prayed, you know, what's called imprecatory psalms. You know, there's, there's like over 20 of those in the, in, the, in the book of Psalms alone, where he's praying that God would judge people. We're going to read it here tonight, if you were paying attention while the scripture's being read. I mean, he's saying, break their arm. You know, we can turn another passage where he's saying, break their teeth out of their mouth. He's saying, you know, he prays these... Psalms where, where, God, where he literally prays that God would kill certain people. He's like, oh, I couldn't believe he'd say that. I can't believe David would pray that. But maybe it's just we don't understand how wicked, wicked people really are. And when we, have, we understand, I'm not saying every, you know, every John Q. sinner out there in, in, in the world today is, is some evil, wicked reprobate. You know, someone, we go out trying to knock on a door and, and share the gospel and say, I'm not interested. We walk, oh, what a reprobate. You know, break his teeth in his mouth. Oh, you know, not every person is like that. In fact, the vast majority of people aren't that bad, right? 
But there are people out there that are that wicked, that, that it would be a good thing if God did take care of them that way, that if God did come down and judge them, even to the point of taking them, taking their own life. That's very biblical. That's a whole other uh, you know, sermon right there into that. But let's look at what the wicked are like tonight. What are the wicked like? And David gives us here a description. He says in verse 2, The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. So David here is showing, what we're going to see throughout this, this, this theme about the wicked is that they're proud and that they persecute the poor because of their pride, because they feel like nothing can touch them. They're beyond, they're so much stronger. They're so much, uh, you know, uh, they're just unreachable. They're untouchable that even God himself isn't going to do anything about it. That's how proud these people have become. And because of their pride, it says there that they persecute the poor. You see, the wicked tonight, they persecute the poor. And look, if you're persecuting poor people, you are a wicked person. I mean, because really, and, and we'll see a little bit more about what the poor, you know, some of their attributes are. But poor people are, generally speaking, you know, defenseless. I mean, you think about the, the guy who's charged, you know, innocently. He, he's, he's, he, he, he's uh, you know, he's charged with a crime that he didn't commit, you know, and, and he can't get off the hook because he doesn't have the money. But then you have some wicked guy who's got enough money and a, enough crooked lawyers in his back pocket. You can literally get away with murder. But the wicked, they persecute the poor. This is something that they do, and that makes, I mean, that should tell us just how bad they really are. Go over to James chapter 2, James chapter 2. You see, poor people are defenseless in a lot of ways. And poor people should be shown pity. We should always sh show pity unto the poor, whether it's, you know, uh, you know poor in a f some physical way, you know, they're weak in some physical way, or especially spiritually. You know, there's a lot of poor people out there today, spiritually speaking. You know, we, we go up into these nicer neighborhoods like we are in today, go through into these gated communities, and say, these people aren't poor. Look, they, they might have all this wealth, but they don't know that they're wretched and naked and blind. They are the poorest people on the earth if they don't have Christ. <coughs> the Bible says, in, uh, you go into James 2, it says in Mark 12, Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, how, this, uh, how say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And of course, if you know the passage here, he's kind of taking it to the Pharisees, right? He's kind of giving it to them. He's kind of he's pushing back on them and you know, challenging them. And it says in verse 37, And David therefore himself calleth him Lord, when, and whence is he then his son? And I love what it says there. And the common people heard him gladly. You know, the Pharisees, they didn't like the fact that Jesus was kind of, you know, putting them on their toes, putting them on their heels, making them have to answer and have to, to, to answer these hard questions and things like that. And it's pushing back. But when the common people saw that, they were glad. They were glad to say, finally, someone's pushing these guys around, these, 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 these big shots, these Pharisees that have just been, you know, binding heavy burdens upon us, and they wouldn't so much as move them with one of their fingers. And now Jesus comes along, and he's pushing back, and the, someone's finally sticking up for the poor, in a sense. And it says that they heard him gladly. Here in James chapter 2, verse 1, look there, it says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. If there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves, and become judges of evil thoughts? What's he saying? He's saying, look, if you have some guy come in, you know, he's got, he's got all the right clothes on, he looks the part, he's, you know, he could throw some money around, he's got, the, he's got the ring and the gold and everything else. And look, there's nothing wrong with having wealth, I'm not against that, but we should be impartial when we judge. We should be impartial in how we're going to treat people. Not say, oh, this guy looks like he could put a little bit more in the offering plate. Oh, come right up front. Come sit right down. What would you like me to preach tonight? You know, is there anything I shouldn't say? I wouldn't want to offend you and scare you off, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Big Bucks <laughs> or whatever. Then we see the other guy come in, you know, obviously, he, you know, his clothes are tattered. You know, maybe he's dirty. Maybe it smells a little bit, you know, <laughs> and not from working. Who knows? You know, I mean, he's just... He doesn't have any much to offer financially or whatever. You know, we shouldn't be partial in that way. If we did that, you know what we'd be doing? We'd be like, we'd be behaving like a wicked person. We'd be, you know, oppressing the poor, treating the poor badly. He said in verse 5, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, 
rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised them that love him. <laughs> and maybe that gives us a clue as why the wicked like to persecute the poor so much. It's not just out of their pride, but because often the poor people are the ones that God is using. Poor people are the ones that God has chosen because they are rich in faith. They're not caught up in all, just gaining all the earthly treasures and just pursuing all the worldly pursuits. They care about the things of God. They care about serving God and living for God and preaching the gospel and so on and so forth. And that is who God has chosen in this world. <clears throat> they are the heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that loved him. He says, he's rebuking him here in James, he says, but ye have despised the poor in verse 6. Do not rich men oppress you? There it is again. Is that it, it, who, Who's being oppressed here? The poor people. And it's the proud, it's the rich that do the oppressing. You see, riches have a way of making people proud, don't they? Riches have a way of making people think that they're just kind of above it all. Kind of thinking, oh, I don't need religion. I don't need a crutch like that. You know, I'm a self-made man. You know, that's for weak, weak people. And, and that, that type of attitude is out there. But it says, do not rich men oppress you and draw you before judgment seats. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called. Now, again, I'm not saying that every rich person is some wicked, evil person either, but that seems to be the, the tendency, isn't it? Is that a lot of times it's the rich that are doing the oppressing. It's the rich. I mean, think about it. How can a poor person oppress people? I mean, they can do it to a limited degree. But look, it takes money to oppress people, doesn't it? It takes money to just, you know, put people down and keep them down and so on and so forth. <coughs> so first of all, what are wicked people like tonight? Well, they, they persecute the poor. And we should never be like that. We should never be the type of people that would oppress the poor. Rather, we should be the type of people that would reach out to the poor, that would want to bring them to Christ. And often, you know, that's who's usually the most receptive to the gospel anyway. You know, we go out to the Indian reservations. We go out to these other poorer communities in the state. And we reach out to those people. Those are typically the more, the, the, even in town here in Tucson, you go into the poorer neighborhoods, you know, typically, speaking they are the more receptive people and, and and here's the thing what's sad about this is that a lot of people e even though that's the fact even though it's a fact that the poor are the ones that god has chosen rich in faith that the poor are the ones that are usually more open to the gospel they're usually the ones that are are left alone the most you know the big mega churches and things like that they're interested in just reaching the wealthy they just want to, you know, they just want to get all the, 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 the high rollers in their society and their community to come in and leave a big offering in the plate so they can build some great building or, <coughs> you know, so the pastor can drive a Ferrari or something like that. Joel Stein. <coughs> it is true. Amen. And, and in Luke chapter 7, and so what I'm saying is this, is that, you know, because, because the poor are often neglected, Jesus even likes it, uh, likens it unto a miracle that anybody would even go into them. If you remember in Luke 7, where, where the, the disciples of John the Baptist came to him and said, Art thou he, or shall we look for another? They, John sent him because he was doubting in prison. And Jesus replied and said unto him, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how the blind see and the lame walk and the leper are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised. Look, if we saw any of those things happen today, we'd just, wow, we'd say, that's amazing. I mean, if we saw the blind see, you know, if we were to just, you know, pray over somebody or help somebody, and their eyes were open, and, and all of a sudden they could see. I mean, that would be an amazing miracle, wouldn't it? If we could make the lame walk, you know, and I'm not talking about, like, what you see in these Pentecostal meetings. That's all fake, folks. Benny Hinn isn't healing anybody. And if it was real, it's like, why isn't he at the hospital then? Why has he got to charge a cover charge? Why does he go swing his jacket around down there in the hospital? You know, why does he go down to the children's cancer ward and, and heal somebody if he's such some great healer? Because it's fake. It's not real. I mean, there was a time, and I want to go into all that, wh where these things did happen, I believe, but that's not today. The lepers are cleansed. You know, just disease is just miraculously, I mean, leprosy often was a death sentence. And he's just doing all these miracles. The deaf here, the dead are raised. I mean, good night if we raise somebody from the dead. I mean, we'd make, we'd make headlines, right? That'd be a big deal. These are great miracles. But he, I love how he ends it. And I know I've met, pointed this out before. And he says, to the poor, the gospel is preached. To the poor, the gospel is preached. This great litany of just amazing miracles. And then he ends it all off. And by the way, the poor have the gospel preached to them. I don't think it's any co coincidence that he threw that in there, that he put all of these things together. 
And people get so caught up today in wanting to see all these. They want to see some sign. They want to see some amazing thing. They want to see the dead raised or something like that. But what about just having the gospel preached to the poor? I mean, that is a miracle in and of itself. And, I, and, and he's saying, I think the reason why he's like, you know, putting it in this list of miracles is because poor people are the neglected people. Because what do they have to offer? I mean, financially speaking, they, I mean, they're poor. They can't offer anything financially. Now, I do believe that we all have the potential to do great things for God, no matter what station we are in life. You know, it, whether we're poor, we're rich, whatever, people, if they would just live for the Lord and, 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 and seek his face and, and serve him, they could do great things for God beyond even what they imagine that they're capable of. I believe that. It has nothing to do with finances. But generally speaking, the poor are oppressed spiritually today because they're neglected, they're forgotten. They don't have the gospel preached to them. And it's a miracle if anybody will even go to them. So we see, first of all, at the wicked, what are they like tonight? Well, they persecute the poor. They persecute people that cannot defend themselves. They're bullies. And that's, that's a pretty, you're a wicked person if you do that kind of a thing. I mean, think how about wicked you have to be just to go pick on somebody. And I'm not just saying, like, you know, you're the school bully, although that is wicked. You know, kids, the way kids treat each other, it, a lot of times are very, is very cruel. It's wicked. But I'm talking about people who are, I mean, you want to talk about oppressing the poor. You know, bombing your country or whatever from, from afar. Or just, you know, levying you know, taxes on people. Just, we know what I'm talking about. This is the kind of oppression that takes place today in the name of the almighty dollar. And poor people are just, I mean, entire nations, you know, continents of people just being oppressed by rich people. <coughs> You'd have to be a pretty wicked person to be like that. Just to be, be just so, you know, calloused and just so willing to just oppress people who can't even defend themselves. This is what the wicked are like. So when you hear somebody get up and get angry at the wicked, when you get s hear some preacher, you know, start to, 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 to say really hard things about wicked people, they deserve it. <laughs> they got what's coming. They're bad people. The wicked are covetous as well. Look at verse 3. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire... And blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. He's saying, look, God abhors this person, and that's the person that God abhors, or another word for that would be hates. Yes, God hates people whom the Lord abhorreth. You know, that's who the wicked blesses. You know, the crooked, covetous politician who's going to bless all of his other crooked, covetous politicians because uh, they're all a bunch of just covetous people. They're wicked. You know, they, that's, they bless one another, they help one another out, they, they, they help, uh, you know, promote each other and, and support one another and oppress the poor. And the Bible says that's who God hates. They love, one, they love what God hates. They, ha they love what God calls wicked. <coughs> and look, he's saying that the, the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous. You know, it's his own heart's desire. That you know, he, he, he lets everyone know the things that he wants and... and he boasts his heart's desire, and he blesses the covetous. And that should tell us that, you know, covetousness, and the Bible speaks a lot about covetousness. And if you would, go over to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5 is that, you know, covetousness is a wicked sin. Anytime you see God, you know, talking about wicked people and then telling you what they're like or what they do, we should pay special attention to that and make sure we're not guilty of any of those things. That we're not being partial, that we're not oppressing the poor, that we're not you know, preferring one above another, and that we're not, you know, in this instance here, being a covetous person. We should not tolerate covetousness in other people, okay? Now, what I'm talking about specifically is within the local church. You know, it, you know we talk a lot about certain sins that'll get you kicked out of church, right? And the ones that we normally talk about are the ones like, you know, drunkenness, fornication, adultery. We, th these are the things that we talk about in 1 Corinthians 5. But we don't normally talk about the ones being, you know, we don't really talk about being covetous, right? I mean, I don't know that I've ever seen anybody get kicked out of church for being covetous. Maybe that's just because we're doing such a good job that nobody's uh, struggling with this to that degree, right? No, one, no one's really getting kicked out of church for being idolater. Around here, in, you know, in America, you know, I don't, no one, no one here, I don't think, is taking other people aside and saying, hey, I got this nice statue of Mary, let's go worship it. Let's go worship some image that some man made and call it God. 
It's, the only reason that is is because it's not a problem here. But if you go over to India, maybe they don't have the problems that we have over here, but uh, they probably have idolatry. They, you know, we're not having to deal, well, we have had to deal with railers, but, you know, or extortioners. I don't, is anybody blackmailing anyone tonight? You know, if you, if you are, come see me after the service, right? But, and covetous is, is one that we, it seems like we should hear more about it. That it should be a problem. Because we're living in a very covetous society that just lifts up, you know, the, 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 the motto, whoever dies with the most toys wins, right? That's what everyone says. And it's just a very materialistic culture that just, pr- just wants to accumulate things and stuff and get a lot of money. That's what's lifted up. That's what's boasted in our society today. And look, we shouldn't tolerate it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother... Okay, so he's talking about a guy that is called a brother, you know, somebody, you know, who's been faithful to the church, someone who's come around, you know, someone that we would call a brother in Christ, you know, a saved person, not just, you know, every guy driving around and, ha- you know, just every covetous person out in the world, because then we would have needs to go out of the world, right? We, we couldn't even, ex- we'd have to go live like hermits somewhere, but he's saying, look, any brother, any brother that's called a fornicator or covetous. With such a one, no, not to eat. So covetous, being covetous is something that's on, on the list. Now, what would that look like? You know, d- if, you know, does that mean like if, if I find out that when you drove by, you know, the, the car dealership, you kind of pumped on the brakes and looked, you rubbernecked a little bit and thought how, how nice that new vehicle would be? Oh, you're so covetous. Now, that is covetousness, isn't it? Does it should you get kicked out of church for that? <laughs> no, because we all, we all probably do things like that. You know, I know I'm thinking about... I had to check myself when we were going through this whole, you know, purchasing a home. When we decided to move down here, we're going we're gonna to make that move. Like, I was saying, oh, I can afford how much, you know, the, the lender says, oh, you can afford X amount. Of, you could, you, you're, this much money is available to you. I was like, oh, really? Oh, in that case, you know, Brother Corbin's moving on up, right? And, and I had to say, wait a minute, you know, just because that's available doesn't mean you should be greedy and covetous and live beyond your means. You need to be reasonable, have something modest, I mean, something sensible. And look, a lot of people would look at the house we're moving into and say, (laughs) wow, you got real excited about that. To us, it's the Taj Mahal. (laughs) I mean, it's like, you know, not just because it has an arched doorway in it, you know. (laughs) It's because when you live in a, you know, two-bedroom apartment with several kids for seven years, you know, you're moving up into anything after that is, is a big step up. But I'm just saying, look, when I got, you know, I'm just using myself as an example. I kind of had to check that, you know, and say, whoa, that's covetous. That's in my own heart. So we, I'm just saying we probably all go through similar things like that where we just, you know, we're just we're browsing through th- some catalog. Just, oh, I'd love to have that. Oh, I can't wait. To, I would do wish I had the money. That is covetousness. Desiring things that you cannot have is covetousness. So, I mean, if, we're, if that's the standard, any time just the slightest bit of covetousness creeps in your heart, it's, you're out of here. You know, this would be an empty building tonight. What he's talking about, I believe, is, 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 is ju- for example, the fornicator, you know, b- Jesus said that if you look upon a woman to lust, you've committed adultery already with her in her heart. You know, and I know adultery and fornication are different things. But you can, you can be a fornicator in your mind, right? There's an, but the actual committing that fornication, that's a whole other degree of sin, right? So just kind of being covetous, like the, the run-of-the-mill covetousness, that people all experience. I don't think that's what he's talking about here. It's people who are, you know, trying, you know, promoting and trying to. Th- th- they just come to church and they're all about money. All they ever talk about is money. And look, there's people out there like that. Like every time you get around them, they just they want to show you what they got or what they're going to get, and, and it just everything is about their possessions and their goods and their money, and they're trying to get you into that too. <coughs> so that type of thing is out there. And the Bible says that we shouldn't tolerate that in a local church, that kind of an attitude of people who want to just come in and, you know, pass out their business cards and just use the church as, you know, as a, as a place to come and do some cold calling, you know, to see if they can get some s- generate some sales in the local church. And look, and I, ever, I always got to clarify when I bring use that as an example, because then somebody will come to me like, hey, I just want to let you know someone came to me and they found out I was a plumber or I was a whatever and they asked me for my card. Is it OK for me? To I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. You know, you can go to a brother, hey, I heard, you know, you know, you can get a card from them and <laughs> use their services. But look, if someone who comes in and they own a business and are just here to like, 
you know, oh, when's the service over? When's he going to stop preaching? I got, all I got a pocket full of cre uh, business cards that I got to hand out. Hey, look me up. You got any car repairs? Need any? You know what I'm talking about. People are going to come in and just use the local church as a springboard for, you know, their sales, for their commissions, for their check. That is covetousness. And, and there's other examples. I want to move on, though. You know, we should not tolerate in others, but even more so, we should be on guard against covetousness in our own hearts. It's something we should be on guard about. I mean, let's not forget it's, you know, it <laughs> it's the Tenth Commandment. You know, thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, thy, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. You know, looking at what somebody else has and saying, I wish I had that. I wish I could make that mine. You know, that's covetousness. And it's, you know, it's like I said on Sunday, when he lists, or a couple weeks ago, when he lists a sin on, that's on the Ten Commandments, that's something you got to pay attention to. I mean, not all, there's a lot of commandments, right? There's a lot of do's and don'ts. There's a lot of thou shalt and shalt nots in the book. But not all of them made the list of Ten Commandments. So we should be on guard against it. Go to Hebrews, if you're still there, Hebrews chapter 13, where I had you go. It says in Ephesians 5, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named among you as become a saints. And we say, oh, I'm never going to let fornication in. I'm never going to be unclean. Well, but what about covetousness? You know, we should be on guard against covetousness in our own heart. He said, let it not once be named among you. He said in Colossians 3, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. And mortify means like, like think about mortuary, mortician, you know, morbid. The, this, it's talking about killing, dying. Mortify your members. Kill your members. Not literally, okay? <laughs> but he's saying, look, you should, you should put down, bring on into subjection your flesh. Mortify your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness. Again, we would say, oh, of course, yeah, never. Inordinate affection. No, not me. Evil concupiscence. You know, which is, you know, just uh, concupiscence is just, you know, very fleshly living, just going uh, beyond the pale, just kind of a, like a, you know, a, 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 a gluttony of whatever sin, just concupiscence. Think of like a cornucopia. Oh, it's like a, 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 a uh, does everyone know what a cornucopia is? Or they got to define that too? Oh, we got one, okay. You know, the, you know the thing at Thanksgiving, the big round thing with all the stuff, the fruit and vegetables coming out, they call that the cornucopia, right? Because it's bountiful, it has a lot of stuff in it, right? I'm trying to use, trying to explain concupiscence here. So it's kind of that same thing, just this, this abounding, just overflowing sin in your life, this evil concupiscence. We would say, oh, none of those things, of course not. And covetousness, you know, that's on that list. And I think today we're kind of numb to it because it's just, it's become such a part of our culture, covetousness. And, we, and if we, I think if we were all honest, self-included, if we, we would catch ourselves. If we really paid attention, we would catch ourselves more often than we probably would want to admit coveting after other things. S looking at houses we can't own, looking at cars we'll never own, toys we'll never own, just on and on and on. It happens all the time because, again, we're living in such a materialistic culture. <coughs> And he says, for such thing, for w uh, which things the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. I mean, these are the type of sins that God judges people over. And, and covetousness is one of them. Again, Hebrews chapter 13, it's kind of a tie-in here in verse 5, where it says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Remember, we started out looking at that, saying, look, he, the promise is, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. But he starts out by saying, let your conversation, how does he apply that promise here in Hebrews chapter 13? He says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You know, God should be enough in our life. The Lord should be enough for us. And people who, who don't feel that way, who tend to think, well, you know, I know the Lord's there, he'll never leave me, but it's not quite enough for me. You know, that's coming out of a covetous heart. And that's coming out of people who don't understand the riches that they have in Christ. The fullness of, of what they have in Christ. You know, and that's something I, I've been thinking about more and more lately. Is just the fact that we need to learn as Christians to lay hold on eternal life. You know, not in the sense of trying to earn our way into heaven, but really grasping what it is that we have in Jesus. What we really have in Christ. It, it, it hath not entered into the heart of my, or the mind of man what God hath prepared for them that love him. 
We can't even imagine what heaven is going to be like. And it seems like it's so distant. Oh, it's so far off. Look, it's one breath away. It's just one heartbeat away. If you're saved, you know, you're there. It's that quick. And all those things you thought you just couldn't live without, all those things you just had to have on earth, they won't even enter your mind in heaven. You, you know, <laughs> it's just, it'll be a joke. If, if you say, well, hey, now that you're here and you see everything that you got, the glorified body beholding the very face of Christ, standing in his presence, you could give all that up and you could finally, if you, but I'll give you that car you wanted. I'll give you that house. You can have that wardrobe or whatever it is. You can have that money you wanted. We'd laugh. But we have a hard time doing that on this side, don't we? On this side, it's, it, we, you know, we see it through a glass darkly. And, and, and we, we say, well, you know, I know he'll never leave me for, for, or forsake me, but I have a real hard time being content with such things as I have. And, I, you know, some of the, ha the happiest people I've ever known in my life have been some of the poorest. I mean, I've known people that one of the happiest families I ever met, they were, li they were living in a single wide trailer and out in the middle of the sticks in northern Michigan. And I mean, the last people that lived there cut wood for the fireplace inside the trailer. They cut the firewood in the living room. And they're moved into this, and I'm saying a family, young kids. There's axe holes in the floor, axe holes in the ceiling, because if you ever swung an axe, you know, it's hard to do in a single wide, right? The, the, the daughter was telling me when she would sleep at night, on a windy night, she could watch the, the wall blow away from the floor and leave a gap <sighs> on a winter night in northern Michigan. But they were some of the happiest people I ever knew. Always smiling, always singing, always loving the Lord. They were some of the happiest people I ever knew, but they were some of the poorest I ever knew. You know, I think about all the, uh, the, the, the bus kids that we picked up on our bus route up there. I mean, they, they want to talk about people. I'm, I'm saying, oh, we had such a tough time in our two-bedroom apartment with our four kids. Look, they had like eight, nine, ten. I mean, they had a big family, and they'd be in these two-bedroom apartments. You'd walk in, oh, Mr. Corbin's here. It was just like a clown car of, <laughs> of, of Ukrainian kids just coming out, just, and the whole living room fills up. But you know what? And people would say, oh, you're so poor, you're so destitute. But they were happy. And isn't it ironic that some of the most miserable people are the people that have it all? That everybody's looking at them, oh, I wish I had what they had. I wish I was cool as they were. I wish I had all the, the clothes and the money and the lifestyle and everything that they have. And if, but if you talk to those people, they're miserable. I mean, how else do you explain all these, these rock stars and, and all these uh, you know, Hollywood actors? They're all on, hooked on drugs. They're all killing themselves. They're all in and out of rehab. They're depressed. You know, money's not going to buy you happiness. It can't. But what can, what can make you happy is if you're content with such things as you have and you come to the understanding and the knowledge that you have Christ. You have eternal life. And then you can say, you know, the, the, the promise, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Verse 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I mean, that's what I want to say. I mean, what would you rather say tonight? You know, my credit limit is my helper on my credit card. My bankroll is my helper. You know, it's not going to deliver you from, from hell. The Lord is my helper. Like, <laughs> I mean, what else do you need? So we see, what are the wicked like tonight? Well, they persecute the poor, they're covetous, and they're proud. It says there, if you want to go back to Psalms 10, in Psalms 10 it says, The wicked through his pride of his countenance will not seek after God, God is not in all his thoughts. So we see another attribute of the, of the wicked, and i got to move quickly here, is the fact that they disregard God. They, he's not in his thoughts. He, does, he will not seek after him out of his pride. Through the pride of his countenance, he will not seek after God. You know, that, that's why the Bible says you have to humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will, he will lift you up. That you have to, if you want to seek God, you have to humble yourself. It takes humility. It takes humility to, uh, to, to, to come to God and to seek him. But the proud, because he is proud, will because he, he cannot do that, he will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. And, you know, I, I, keep, I know i got to hurry up, but just as I, even as I'm just reading these, th it's just these other thoughts are coming to me. It's just, just to think about, he's saying of the wicked that God is not in all his thoughts. He didn't say, well, God's in some, God is not in some of his thoughts. 
you know, God is not in, you know, 50% of his thoughts. And it just, I mean, you, then you kind of have to just, you know, draw the conclusion that we, God should be in all our thoughts. <laughs> it really should. You know, perfect peace have they which love thy law. You know, oh, how I love thy law is my meditation all the day. Not just, you know, my 10, 15, 20 minutes of Bible reading. It's my meditation all the day long. You know, and I think if we would do that, if we would keep God in all of our thoughts and everything that we do and every and all the actions we take every day of our life, if we would just keep God in all our thoughts, we would be more content and happy people. If we kept God, we would have peace. A great peace have they which love thy law. If we made it hi, his law, our meditation all the day, we would have peace. But the wicked will never have that because God is not in all his thoughts. He disregards God and he also disregards man. If you look at verse 5, he says, For his ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. They, you know, the wicked, they can't even understand what God is like. His judgments are far above out of his sight. They can't even begin to comprehend what God is even like. <coughs> They are above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth them. Now, he's talking about the wicked's enemies, right? As for all of his enemies, that's referring back to the wicked, he puffeth at them. So it's not like if you're a wicked person, you're not going to, you know, you're going to have enemies. And you're, and even, you're going to even have enemies. Other wicked people will be your enemies. And he says, he puffeth at them. Like, pfft. You know, that's the, that's the image I get. Like he's just like, pfft, whatever. You know, he just puffs at them. He mocks them. He said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. And that's a very proud statement. I shall not be moved. No, I'm untouchable. I'm invincible. My enemies can't do anything to me. That's, a very, that's very proud, right? Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall, the Bible says. <coughs> and what he's showing us here is that, you know, if you're, if you're going to be humble with God, right? Because, again, this is a proud person. He's not seeking after God. He's not in all his thoughts. His ways are grievous. He's puffed up. He puffeth at his, adverse, at his enemies. He says, I shall never be moved, right? So he, he's, he disregards both God and man. He says they're both, he's just like, they're nothing to me. You know, I'm not going to be moved. I'll see never be in adversity. I don't care if it's God. His judgments are far above out of my sight. God, man, doesn't matter who it is. I'm number one. I'm never going down, right? That's kind of the attitude that you're seeing here. But so what we see here is that if you're going to be humble with God, if a person is truly humble with the Lord, they will be humble before man and vice versa. It's impossible to treat your fellow man correctly without knowing and, and, and treating God correctly. You know, if, if we say that we love God and hate it, and if a man say if he love God and hateth his brother in his heart, you know, how dwelleth the love of Christ in him? And I'm kind of paraphrasing there, but you get my point. That's what the Bible says. You can't say, oh, I love God, and then hate your brother. It doesn't work that way. And if we're really humble with God, a person is sincerely humble with God, they will be humble towards their fellow man as well. <coughs> I want to move along because I, I need to wrap up. So we see tonight, what are the wicked like? Well, they persecute the poor. They're covetous. They're proud. And they are liars. As we see here in the end, it says, his mouth is full of cursing in verse 7. And deceit and fraud are under his tongue. Uh, excuse me, under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages, in the secret places doth he murder the innocent. I mean, it's, well, you shouldn't be so hard on the wicked. I mean, they're murdering the, the innocent in, in, in secret places. His eyes are privily sit against the, set against the poor. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. He croucheth, he humbleth himself, and not like he's humble. He croucheth, humbleth, like he gets low, like because he's likening him unto a lion. You ever have you seen the house cat that's stalking the bird? You know how they do that thing where they get below and they're ready to pounce. They kind of their shoulders go back and they do that thing. That's what he's talking about here. That's the picture that he's painting. He croucheth, he humbleth himself, right? That the poor may fall by his strong ones. He's talking about how the the the, the, the wicked man is somebody who's just looking to pounce on and take advantage of the poor, and the innocent. <coughs> now, I love verse 11. It's just, he, sa he says in verse 11, He has said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. 
So wicked people, they do all these, you say, why would they be so brash to do all these wicked things? To, to, to slay the innocent and private, you know, privily, to, to lay in wait against innocent people and, and to oppress the poor and to be so proud. How could, and say that God is, you know, that God is, a, his judgments are above, they're far away from me, I shall never be moved, I'll never be, how could a person be so brash and so bold to say such things and to behave in such a way? Because he has said in his heart, God hath forgotten. But what does the Bible say? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You know, the, the people that go, oh, there's no God. The Bible says you're a fool if you say that. Because we can just look around at creation and say, well, obviously there's a God. This didn't just happen. You know, this, you know contrary to the, to the textbooks at school, everything was not smaller than the period on a page one time and then exploded into everything. There was nothing and then nothing became everything. And that's how we got here. Yeah, but we're the we're the ones that are you know living you know that we're the ones that are are foolish in the eyes of the world, right? Anyway, I don't want to go off on that. But the fool says in his heart, the wicked say in their heart, God hath forgotten; he hideth his face; he will never see it. And it reminds me of those people. And we won't turn there for the sake of time. In Ezekiel's day, remember when the angel took Ezekiel back to the temple, and he and he made him go through the hole in the wall and then through the door, and he said, "Look on the elders of Israel, what they do in the dark in the smoke." They were burning incense, and they had made all the images, the creeping things. They're doing it in God's house. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're worshiping idols. But they weren't worshiping them out in the open gate, were they? He, didn't, he, didn't, he had to make them go through a wall and through a door into this smoke-filled room where they got their light, you know, lit everything up and their candles, and they're doing it in secret. And they said, you know, you know God will not see. They said similar things. They said, you know, God has forgotten. He doesn't see what we're doing. It's like, well, if God doesn't see and God doesn't know what you're doing, why are you doing it so secretly? Because here's the thing. Wicked people, can, he can say that in his heart. But you know what? In the back of their minds, they all know God exists. That's why they have to creep around and do it. That's why they have to humble themselves and crouch and seek on, you know, pray on the poor and privily, you know, and do their wicked abominations in the dark and hide because they know that God, in fact, does see. They might say that in their heart, but the fact is, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord go, uh, 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 go to and fro. Oh, how's it go? The eyes of the Lord go, uh, the eyes of the Lord are in all the earth beholding the evil and the good. I believe that's how it is. But the Bible says that God sees everything. There's that, that, that nothing is hidden from his eyes. That all things are, are naked and open and unto him to, with whom we have to do. God does see it all. And only a fool would say, well, God doesn't see that. God doesn't see what I'm doing. And they know in the back of their minds that God does see it. Let's move on. So we see here what the wicked are like tonight. This is just kind of a very, of course, this isn't all encompassing. The wicked are a lot of other things too, aren't they? The Bible talks a lot about the wicked. But David kind of gives us here an idea of what these wicked people are like. And that's why you got to keep that in mind as you move into verse 12. Okay? Because this is when David starts to pray, right? And he doesn't pray, oh, be merciful unto those poor, wicked people that do all these wicked things and just help them to see the error of their ways and to come around and, and to stop slaying the innocent and oppressing the poor and lying and being so proud. That's not what he prays. What does David pray? Verse 12, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine hand, forget not the humble. Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? He has said in his heart, Thou wilt not require it. Thou hast seen it, for thou beholdest the mischief and spite to requite it with thine hand. The, uh, the poor committeth himself unto thee. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. I mean, that's his prayer. Break his arm, God. Destroy him. And this is, you know, as far as Psalms go and, and, and David's other imprecatory prayers, this is kind of mild. He's not saying like, you know, let him melt as a snail. You know, let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. You know, he's not just, you know, cursing the, the everybody in the guy's family, which David does. And he's, this is still a, a mild one, but he's still saying, look, seek them out till thou find none. Find every last one of them and break their arms. He's entreating the Lord to act. And, you know, just real quickly, I, I'd point out, you know, is that you don't want to be on the wrong end of a godly man's prayers. <laughs> it's just not the place to be, you know. And because the Bible says, you know, the, 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 the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And David's right to pray these prayers and these kind of prayers where he's praying judgment against wicked people. And God answers those prayers. 
You know, and, and people who are wicked should take heed to that. You know, people that want to mock and, and ridicule and attack a man of God. You know, and, I, and let me just clarify, I don't mean, you know, just some movement. I'm saying they're attacking men of God and their families and their friends and good godly people in churches. They should take heed to that. That the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And I've already preached a whole sermon about that recently. But it, it's worth mentioning. You don't want to be on the wrong end of the godly man's purse. Now, I said in the beginning how, you know, David, when he started out in the psalm, he's saying, you know, why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in trouble? But I think after reading this, we can see that, that, for, that verse 14, he kind of gives us the context of verse 1. He says, thou hast seen it. Thou beholdest the mischief and the spite. Remember, he started out by saying, you stand afar off. You know, thou, you hide yourself in times of trouble. See, all these bad things are, are, not th- are going on, and it's like God is hiding himself. You know, you stand afar off, Lord. But then by the time we get to verse 14, he's saying, Thou hast seen it. Thou beholdest the mischief and the spite to requite at thine hand. The poor committeth unto the sea, thou art the helper of the fatherless. So even when we f- might feel like the Lord isn't there, we know that he is. But, you know, that's one application of verse 1. But I think more... S- all th- what, what's going on here with David specifically is that verse 1 seems more like David is testing the Lord. Like he's kind of putting it to the Lord. Like he's saying, why standest thou afar off? Why hidest thou thyself? Because David already knows that, that God does see. So I don't want to say, I don't want to use the word that he's provoking God, but it's kind of like he's testing the Lord. And not in a bad way. And look, God wants us to test him. You know, he, he says that. He says in Jeremiah, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You know, God wants us to, to put him to the test and to to call upon him and to and to, act, you know, have him to act on our behalf. I think that's kind of what's going on in verse one. He's saying, boy, God, it kind of seems like you're not paying attention. It seems like you're kind of far off. Here's what all these wicked people are doing. And then he gets to the end and says, arise. You know, he makes his case for God. God, you shouldn't stand afar off. You should, you know, you don't be aloof. Don't be, uh, don't hide yourself in time of trouble. Arise, lift up thine hand. Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? Thou wilt re- not, re- uh, God, he has said this, God, thou wilt not require it. Thou hast seen it. He said, look, I know you see it, Lord. And he wants him to act. So I think that's kind of the context of verse one. It's not just that David's down in the dumps and feeling sorry for himself. Well, God doesn't know. He's saying, look, Hey, God, <laughs> look what's going on here. You know, are you going to stand aloof? Aren't you going to do something about it? Aren't you going to act? Because we know that the poor trust in you and that you will require it. I think that's what he's, what's going on here. And then verse 16, just some great verses. He kind of just gives God the glory at the end. He says in verse 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. You know, God's not, there's not going to be a re-election. It's not like God's going to have to run again you know, when he rules and reigns on this earth. When Christ returns and sets up his kingdom and then gives it over to the Father after a thousand years, it's not like he's going to have to keep trying to, to win that office. That's, you know, he is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. And that's what's so crazy about the wicked and walking around thinking that they're just you know, untouchable. It's like your, your breath is in God's hand. Everywhere you step is God's. The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof, the Bible says. Verse 17, that the Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear. So you can see how in the beginning it sounded like he's like, oh, why do you stand afar off? And then he's just so assured at the end that God is going to hear, that God has heard, that he will prepare their heart, that he will cause his ear to hear. And what is he going to do? To judge the fatherless and the oppressed that the man of earth may no more oppress. And, and, and it, you know, I, I know I got to close, but just, I, you know, that phrase, I love that so much, to judge the fatherless of the oppressed. You know, um, it, when he's saying judge there, he's not just saying like, you know, we always have a negative connotation, right? When we say, don't judge me, right? Well, look, sometimes people get judged and they're found innocent or they're found worthy of praise, right? Well, sometimes when you judge people, you put them, in the, it's like putting people in the balances. Sometimes the, the, the scale works to your advantage. Someone judges you and says, hey, you did right. You're righteous. Your cause is right. So judgment is, it, ju- judging is impartial. It's not just, inf- it's not always just this bad connotation. It's neutral. 
it's who's being judged that kind of determines the, you know, the outcome. And he's saying here that, you know, he, he's there, he will cause his eye in the ear to judge the fatherless. What is he saying? He's saying he's going to under, he's going to look at the fatherless and he's going to have pity on them. Judge the fatherless and the oppressed. You know, and, and, and this is always just something that's always struck a chord with me because of the fact that, you know, coming from a broken home, not having a dad in the home, it's kind of nice to know that God, you know, pays attention to the fatherless. I'm not saying he prefers them above those that have, obviously the ideal is a mom and dad in the home and so on and so forth, right? That's ideal. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not cheapening that. I'm not lessening that. That's what we should want. But what I am saying is that God understands the plight of the fatherless and that I believe it gets God's attention. That, and, you know, and here's the thing. It, it likens the fatherless and the oppressed because in society, you know, the fatherless are the ones that, that they, they tend to suffer. When they don't, you know, they don't have a father in the home. Uh, I mean, you look at what's going on, you know, in black communities, you know, where, where <laughs> you know, just they're all going to jail, you know, by just it's like a quarter. You know, I, I read the statistics. It's 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 amazing. It's it's mind boggling. The, the amount of, you know, the, the black men that, are, that go to jail in this country, they make up the vast majority of population and minorities. But and, and it's not because of the color of their skin. It's because of the fact that they're growing up in a culture and a society that does not value the father. That dad, you know, dad's out of the picture. And, and as a result, you know, whether they brought it upon themselves or not, they are oppressed in a sense. Not having that father, you know, leaves you vulnerable, right? And what this is, what's great about this verse is that one of the things that God does is he judges the fatherless and not in a bad way. It's saying there that he, he understands their cause, he judges them. And he's the one that stands up for them. And he knows what they go through. <laughs> it's a great, it's just a great thing. You know, it's, it's a great promise. You know, and it could probably be, you know, something that, that uh, other people could think about. Because I'm sure I'm not the only one that's been in that, that position. So what we see happening here is that, you know, <coughs> David is starting out kind of, you know, I believe testing God, kind of giving the idea that maybe God doesn't see, or why is God afar off? But what he what he ends up saying in the end is that God does see, that that nothing is is slipping past God's attention, you know. And we should never get this fatalistic attitude where we think, well, it's just what's it's all for naught. God obviously, you know, and especially nowadays, I mean, the world is getting so bad and so wicked. It'd be real easy to develop that attitude, wouldn't it? Just say, well, look how bad it is. God must God must stand afar off. He hides himself. You know, but maybe what we need to do is actually do what David does and actually pray to God, ask him to answer, to, to, to respond to that wickedness and to, to rise up and to judge and to stand up for the poor and the oppressed. And what I love about that is that, you know, David stands in the fact that God has answered prayers in the past. He said, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. He's saying, look, we've prayed to you and you've heard it in the past. We've seen God act before. You know, maybe the reason we don't see God act in our lives is because we've never prayed. <laughs> we have not because we ask not, right? So that, that's the message tonight, is that we shouldn't just, you know, get this negative attitude and just get all down in the dumps just because we see wicked people doing wicked things. You know, we should test God and ask him and pray and ask him to work on our behalf and to judge and to, you know, and ultimately we know the outcome, you know, that God is going to, I, I, he's, he says there at the end, uh, that will judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that man of the earth may no more oppress. I mean, when, when it's going to come, when he comes to rule, oppression is just going to be done with completely. And we look forward to that day. Let's go ahead and pray.